Today I'll be doing a biomechanical analysis of a skill in rhythmic gymnastics. First starting off with a brief history of this sport. In the earlier 20th century, equipment such as ropes, hoops, and balls were used to do exercise. Many countries began really exploring different types of movement with these apparatus. Incorporating many different techniques from ballet, this sport was done recreationally and notably the Soviet Union until in 1961 when it was finally recognized as a sport by FIG. The first World Championships was held in Budapest in 1963 and the first appearance of this sport in the Olympics was 1984. Rhythmic gymnastics seems to be a form of gymnastics that is still very overshadowed by different types such as artistic or trampolining, so I thought I would give a quick introduction to the sport. It's a sport performed with apparatus such as rope, hoop, ball, clubs, and ribbon requiring skills such as hand-eye coordination, flexibility, and stamina. Gymnasts can perform individually with a routine of about 90 seconds or in a group of typically five gymnasts with routines of about 150 seconds. Higher levels of competition only have a women's category, but men's rhythmic gymnastics is still being explored in many European and Asian countries. The skill I will be analyzing today is called a turning split leap. This leap is a very popular body element that many high-level gymnasts incorporate into their routines because many of them can be done in a row, which increases their difficulty score without wasting much time in their routine. There are also different variations of this jump. For example, some gymnasts do it with an arched back. In general, judges will only reward the gymnast's points if their legs are in a split or over-split position, and the gymnast may even receive a deduction for not being in the correct shape. To prepare for this body element, gymnasts will typically perform this move called a chasse, where they do a galloping motion with one leg extended to the front to push off into the air. The two legs meet together before the back leg lands on the ground, followed by the front leg. This move is done before almost all leaps to build momentum for the actual jump, and this allows gymnasts to jump as high as possible. Their arms should also swing out to the side to help build momentum for the leap. The next phase, the gymnasts will take two big steps in a turning motion. Their knees should be bent and they should bring their arms closer to their body before swinging their front leg out, along with their arms, and then followed by their back leg. From the turning motion to the actual split leap, the gymnast is transitioning from rotational motion into vertical motion. And the next phase, at the critical instant, the gymnast reaches the highest point of their split leap. For those who are more flexible at this moment, their legs are in an over-split position. All the force that was produced from phase 1 and 2 is let out at this moment. The gymnast will want to have their arms out to the side to maximize the force produced. However, their arm movement may be hindered depending on what they are doing with the apparatus. For the last phase, the gymnast will land on their front leg, which should be bent, followed by their back leg, absorbing the force from the landing by bending their knees for a brief moment before straightening them again. For those who are doing more than one leap in a row, they will go back to phase two and then phase three and then back to this phase. For those who are finishing the skill, they may do a partial or full revolution to slow down any rotational motion left. And for this next part, I'll be comparing two different individuals doing the skill. This first individual is a beginner in rhythmic gymnastics and does not have any experience in this sport. And this next individual, the expert in this comparison, has been doing rhythmic gymnastics for many years and has a lot of experience in this jump. Now we will be moving on to applying the biomechanical principles and doing a qualitative analysis on this skill. The first principle describes stability. It states that the greater the mass, the lower the center of mass to the base of support, and the closer the center of mass to the base of support, the more stable. Similar to jumps in figure skating, jumps in rhythmic gymnastics requires a lot of height. To produce this, gymnasts depend on quick changes from one position to the next. 
making themselves, in fact, unstable. This skill requires the gymnast to be unstable in order for them to reach their maximum height. This frame-by-frame -frame breakdown shows how the center of mass and the width of the base of support are constantly changing, lessening the stability of the gymnast. We can see how the beginner's center of mass is not changing as much as the expert's, and this results in her not being able to jump as high. The beginner's width of base of support is also not changing as much from frame to frame, as she is not taking as big of steps as the expert, so her body remains more stable throughout, and she isn't able to perform the skill as well. Now moving on, the second and third principle describes how to produce maximum effort during a skill. Principle 2 states that the production of maximum force requires the use of all possible joint movements that contribute to the task's objective. And Principle 3 states that the production of maximum velocity requires the use of joints in order from largest to smallest. From the expert, we can see that she does a deep plie during phase 1 and 2, bending her knees before taking off. All her joints change from being flexed to being extended, shown in this frame especially, which shows how she is maximizing her use of joint movement. We can also see that her ankles are being dorsiflexed until when she lifts herself off the ground, then really pointing her feet out in plantar flexion. She uses her arms as well to assist in her jump, swinging them from under and extending them at the highest point of the jump. To produce the maximum velocity, we can see how the use of her joints move from her hips, then to her knees, and finally to her ankles being the last part to take off the ground. Now, if we compare this to the beginner, her plies are not as deep, and she does not bend her knees as much. And she also doesn't straighten them out as much afterward, showing how she is not maximizing her joint movement. During phase one, she does not use her arms as much, keeping them out to the side for the most part. In phase two, instead of swinging her arms under and out, she swings them up and over, which does not help in her leap. In the critical instant, her feet are still dorsiflexed, which shows how she did not use all possible joint movements to contribute to the jump, and therefore did not produce maximum force. Principle 4 and 5 are related to linear motion. Principle 4 states that the greater the applied impulse, the greater the increase in velocity. And Principle 5 states that movement usually occurs in the direction opposite that of the applied force. When we look at the expert, she takes larger steps in preparation for the leap. This means she requires more time to generate the force for her leap, which means the force of her legs off the ground is applied for longer, resulting in a greater overall impulse. Her deep plies allow her legs to move a greater range of motion, which will maximize her push off the ground, bringing her in the opposite direction, up in the air. Her large impulse allows her to reach her oversplit high up in the air at the critical instant. When she lands the jump in the recovery phase, she does the reverse of how she took off to absorb the force coming down. This is done by landing with bending her knees, then gradually straightening them out. Landing in this plie position will prevent injuries because the force is being absorbed over a period of time, gradually decreasing the momentum, instead of just at one instant. Now moving on to the beginner, she does not take as big of steps in phases 1 and 2, nor does she bend her knees as much, making it so she has less time to generate her impulse. This will result in a smaller impulse being created because of the small range of motion of her preparation. Therefore, her ability to jump high and perform this skill well is less than that of the expert. During her follow-through phase, she does not absorb the force gradually. Her landing to the jump does not flow, but instead, she rapidly lands without gradually letting her body absorb the force through a period of time. Principle 6 and 7 relate to angular motion. Principle 6 states that angular motion is produced by the application of a force acting at some distance from an axis by torque. Principle 7 states that angular momentum is constant when an individual or object is free in the air. During the preparation for the leap, the gymnast does one turn rotating along the longitudinal axis. 
She brings her arms close to her body during this turn to minimize the moment of inertia, allowing her to build angular velocity. After the two steps, she extends her leg into the split position along with her arms extending out, which increases her moment of inertia and allows her to resist the angular motion, resulting in her being able to jump up. When her legs extend out, it is now rotating along the horizontal axis. Her leg acts as the eccentric force, along with her hip joint, which is where the horizontal axis lies. The amount of torque that she produces by her legs are maximized through her deep plie, which increases the magnitude of the applied force when she lifts up, as well as the length of the lever, which is maximized by her legs being extended as she brings them up. Now if we look at our beginner, she brings her front leg up when she's still rotating along the longitudinal axis. This increases the moment of inertia at the wrong time, preventing her from generating a lot of angular velocity, which will then be transferred to her being able to jump high. As she lifts her front leg, we can see that it is bent, which following principle 6 means that less torque is produced as she tries to lift up from the ground compared to an extended leg as we saw from the expert. The leg, which is a lever, being bent and thus shortened, the magnitude of torque produced is not maximized. And we can see the difference in the heights between the expert and the beginner over here. After breaking down the individual components that makes a good turning split leap, the differences between how the beginner versus how the expert executes the skill contrast each other. Using the individual phases of this skill, as well as applying the biomechanical principles, it shows how important small details are to performing this skill. Just like many other elements in rhythmic gymnastics, a turning split leap requires a lot of repetition, stretching, and conditioning. And with that, I'll conclude this video about a biomechanical analysis of a rhythmic gymnastics skill. Until next time!